Thank you, everyone. It is now 55 minutes after the hour, and uh, ACIP will now reconvene uh, to start with the respiratory syncytial virus vaccine. Um, and I am happy to invite the chair of the RSV Vaccines Workgroup, Dr. Camille Cotton, to provide an introduction and overview of today's session. Thank you, Dr. Lee. This afternoon, I'll be introducing the work group for disease due to uh, respiratory syncytial virus in adults. This work group will complement the one chaired by Dr. Sarah Long, who focuses on RSV disease in infants and children. Today, the two work groups will, join, will be jointly presenting on the epidemiology of RSV across the lifespan. Next slide, please. This is the current work group membership. Notably, um, we may still welcome liaisons from additional professional organizations such as IDSA, the National Foundation for Infectious Disease, um, et cetera. And um, I would just like to highlight that today, one of our consultants, Marie Griffin, had a nice editorial in the New England Journal about RSV vaccines. Next slide, please. There are other CDC, CDC staff contributing to the work group, as you can see here, and we're very appreciative of their efforts. Next slide, please. The purpose of the work group is that um, first, RSV is a major cause of lower respiratory illness, particularly among infants and children and among older adults and adults with chronic medical conditions. RSV vaccine and immunoprophylaxis development has progressed in the past decade with over 40 candidate vaccines and monoclonal antibodies currently in development. Target populations for whom those, um, these products are intended include infants and young children, pregnant women, and older adults. This work group will con uh, consider policy questions related to adult vaccination. Next slide, please. So the work group activities in uh, include considering recommendations for use of RSV vaccines in adults to first review the epidemiology and burden of RSV disease in older adults, Second, review the efficacy, immunogenicity, safety, and cost-effectiveness of these vaccine in older adults. Third, provide evidence-based recommendations regarding routine use of RSV vaccines in older adults. And fourth, identify areas in need of further research for informing potential future vaccine recommendations, including um, risk-based ind indications for adults with underlying medical conditions younger than the age for routine immunization um, recommendation. Next slide, please. So there are five different adult RSV vaccine products expected to be reviewed by the work group in the near future. GSK started its uh, pivotal phase three trial in May of last year. They have developed a protein-based uh, vaccine adjuvanted with their proprietary compound, which is also used in Shingrix and other GSK vaccines. Pfizer started a phase three trial in September of 2021. Uh, they have a protein-based vaccine with no adjuvant. Janssen also started its pivotal phase three trial in September of 2021. They have an adenovirus vector, the same used uh, in the COVID-19 vaccine made by them combined with a soluble protein. Moderna started its phase three trial in February of 2022. They have an mRNA vaccine and Bavarian Nordic uh, started their phase three trial in April of 2022. They have a vaccinia vector including multiple RSV vaccine antigens. Next slide, please. And here is our uh, tentative timeline um, where now we will be discussing the epidemiology and burden of RSV disease. In October, we will have one to two manufacturer um, presentations and review grade for one to two vaccine products. And then you can see in February and June, we will be doing more manufacturer presentations, grade review, cost effectiveness, ETR, and policy options over time, uh, such that there may actually be an effective, if things go well, um, an effective vaccine on the market for um, the season in later 2023. Next slide, please. And here's the agenda for today, um, as you can see on this slide. Next slide, please. And thanks very much. And I look forward to all those presentations and to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. And next, we'll turn it over to Dr. Natalie Thornburg to discuss um, RSV variant and vaccine products. 
Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, okay, to, my name is Dr. Natalie Thornburg with the CDC, and today I'm going to go through about 10 slides, just giving you a little bit of background about the virus um, and the vaccines that are in preclinical and clinical trials right now. Next slide, please. Um, so RSV is a filamentous um, virus, filamentous pleomorphic virus um, that's that's part of the uh, orthopneumovirus family. It has um, a 15.2 kilobase pair genome. Um, it has a single-stranded negative sense RNA genome that encodes 11 proteins. It can be broadly divided into two subgroups or serotypes, A viruses and B viruses. And those A viruses and B viruses are known to co-circulate within, um, within uh, communities at the same time. And the, the cartoon on the left is just um, a diagram of the viral genome and the, the proteins it encodes. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, a, this is a cartoon of what the virion looks like. It's got uh, an envelope and then the two major proteins, which I've highlighted, um, the two major proteins on the surface of the virus are the attachment protein G or glycoprotein or, and the fusion protein F. Um, both of these proteins can be targets for neutralizing antibodies. And there are products in preclinical and clinical trials that target um, just F alone, or some of them uh, contain both F and G and sometimes other antigens as well. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned F and G are um, both targets of neutralizing antibodies, but we know through um, absorption assays where you take serum and then absorb out um, uh, absorb out antibodies to a specific protein that most of the neutralizing activity is directed against the F protein, but not all. Um, the G protein is what defines RSVA versus RSVB. And it's used because it has um, a pretty heterogeneous sequence. It's got two large mucin-like domains, which provide antigen masking. Next slide. Um, so RSVG establishes the A and the B viruses, and that's because it's the most variable in, in the genome, and F is more conserved. Um, and this is just a map. This is a figure from a paper in Journal of Virology of a map of the variability in the first, um, the first half of the genome. Um, this map lacks the second half of the genome, which encodes really just one um, protein, the L polymerase, which is fairly conserved and not a target for neutralizing antibodies. Um, so across the top of this is the um, gene products are listed, NS2, and NS1, NS2, N. Um, and then the percent variability within an entire gene between A and B viruses is shown in parentheses. The percent variability across the entire gene within B viruses um, is listed in the top in red. And then uh, the substitution per site of each amino acid is shown in the graph with RSVA viruses being in black and RSVB viruses are in red. I want you to specifically pay attention to the G gene and the F gene or G protein and F proteins. And because those are the targets of neutralizing antibodies. The number of um, substitution per site of RSVA um, is, is higher, and RSVB in red is higher in each, in each residue and then also sort of across the whole gene in G than, than F, um, with um, about 53% differences, differences between A and B viruses in G and only 15% differences between A and B viruses in F. Um, just for context, uh, like an H1 versus H3 hemagglutinin is about 60% divergent. Um, and Omicron spike versus ancestral spike has about 3% amino acid changes. So we're not seeing as much divergence in RSV viruses between A and B, but a little bit more in uh, Omicron uh, versus ancestral strain. Um, though, though Omicron, those mutations were more concentrated in the receptor binding domain, which may have contributed to partial escape. Next slide, please. Um, 
So F may not have much sequence diversity, but it has a lot of structural diversity, and it exists in at least two or more structural forms that present very differently to the immune system. And this figure is a crystal structure, or two crystal structures of the same protein with the same, with the same sequence. The left is a demi-stable, demi-stable pre-fusion form of uh, the F protein. Um, and the right is a more stable post-fusion F protein. And different antigenic regions or epitopes are colored on the surface. And you can see that there are some sites that are present in the pre-fusion stable um, that are not present in the post-fusion, or at least not uh, accessible in the post-fusion, like site zero, which is red, and site two, which is orange orange. Um, antibodies that bind these antigenic regions can have different uh, potencies, and it's known that antibodies against site 0, red, and site 5, uh, orange, are more potent, and site 1 tend to be less potent, and site 1 is in blue. I told you two slides ago that the most potently neutralizing antibodies are directed against F, um, and in these same studies, Preabsorption of sera with prefusion F removes almost all neutralizing activity, um, consistent with the idea that um, site zero and site five have the most um, potently neutralizing antibodies directed against them. Next slide, please. Um, so there are at least five general categories of RSV preventatives in clinical trials, which Dr. Cotton uh, covered several of those. But the categories include four different kinds of vaccine products. Um, live attenuated and chimeric uh, vaccines, which would contain many antigens, protein-based, which can be subdivided into at least three different uh, kinds of protein-based vaccines, either inactivated whole virus, particle-based vaccines, or subunit traditional protein vaccines. Um, the third being nucleic acid vaccine products, and then recombinant vectors, such as the Bavarian Nordic product that she mentioned. Um, and then the last kind of uh, product that um, is in clinical trials are immunoprophylaxis products. There's one already um, being used in for, for pediatric cases, Synergis or palavizumab, and then there are multiple new monoclonal antibody immunoprophylaxis um, in preclinical and clinical trials. Next slide, please. This is a figure that's maintained um, by PATH. Um, this is an RSV vaccine and monoclonal antibody snapshot where you can track all the different products that are in preclinical and clinical trials. They update this frequently, and you can see on the bottom left when this was most recently updated, and you can see um, the link um, on the very bottom of the figure where you can find this. They have it subdivided in the same way I mentioned before with the four different kinds of vaccine products. Um, um, along the top, and then the immunoprophylaxis on the bottom. And then they show you um, how these are going to be tested, either for pediatric use, P, <clears throat> maternal use, M, or um, being <clears throat> tested in uh, elderly. Next slide, please. All right, so I mentioned to you that um, uh, monoclonal antibodies or antibodies can bind to different regions of, of the fusion protein. And all of the monoclonal antibodies that are either uh, licensed or in clinical trials are directed against the fusion protein. Synergis or palavizumab, which is already licensed, is directed against uh, site two, orange, which you can see in prefusion. I'm sorry, not site two is yellow, which is present in both prefusion and postfusion F. And then uh, there, there's nirsivimab, which is under clinical trials, several other ones, but nirsivimab is directed against site zero. And then I mentioned Regeneron uh, septuvimab, which had been in clinical trials that was stopped, that was directed against um, site four. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I already told you a little bit about the variability in G and across F, but it's a little bit more complicated in F. There's not a lot of variability in F, but I told you that there's structural variability. And you can imagine in that rearranging of the protein that there are some epitopes that we call discontinuous epitopes. So that the residues that are bunched together, like site zero, when it's in prefusion, are not actually next to each other if you take the amino acids and put them in a line. 
Um, and so this is this is a manuscript um, published by uh, Tony Piedra and Anne Health um, from Baylor, where they looked at um, a thousand more than a thousand sequences from viruses um, collected between 1961 and, and 2014, and they looked at amino acid variability, and that's um, uh, in RSVA and RSVB viruses, and they mapped it on top of the antigenic regions. Um, and so you can ignore like the lines going downwards because those are silent mutations. The coding mutations um, go up from the middle of the axis upwards. And you can see there's more variation in RSVB viruses in the fusion protein. And there are regions where there's quite a lot of variation and regions where there's not so much variation. So if you look at RSVA, um, the regions that have, um, uh, that, that encode um, these site zero site are generally fa fairly conserved, but there is some mutation in RSVB viruses in that site zero. Next slide. Uh, so in quick summary about the virus um, and vaccine products, F and G are on the surface of the virus and are targets for neutralizing antibodies with the most potent antibodies directed against the F protein. RSV trial vaccine products have some, some of them have just the F protein or a combination of F and other RSV antigens. And immunoprophylactics are directed against, anti, or against the F protein. There is some heterogeneity in the RSV F protein, uh, which could could affect um, the could affect the um, uh, could affect monoclonal antibody prophylaxis um, or potentially vaccines. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you. This presentation is now open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to um, say thank you for sharing the large number of clinical trials going on and this variability. One of the questions that I have, and maybe I'm anticipating a coming session, is um, have they, uh, have we, um, synchronize the outcomes across these studies like we did with COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Um, I don't have a good answer to that question. I think uh, Dr. McMorrow has, um, or Dr. Jones may have been um, looking a little bit more closely at endpoints <clears throat> between the different trials. Yes, hi, this is Dr. McMorrow. I can confirm that the majority of the trials look at uh, medically attended lower respiratory tract infection as a primary outcome and RSV-associated hospitalizations as a secondary outcome. Dr. Long. So would you speculate, uh, Dr. Thornburg, that the, the fact that we have multiple RSV infections, even in the same season, is not predominantly um, related to mutation and escape, but rather some um, aberrances of the mucosal immune response that's very short-lived. It may, it may I, not be aberrant, but uh, for, for mucosal. Yes. But, it's more that than it is that the virus changes. Yes, I would agree with that. Within a season, there does not tend to be uh, a lot of virus drift, but RSV is well known to not establish good immunological memory, RSV infections, and particularly not good um, mucosal immunological memory. So yes, I would agree with that hypothesis. And it. it generally is the case that vaccines very infrequently do better than natural infections. So we will be interested to see um, the, you know, efficacy as well as the duration of efficacy 
clinically. Thank you. I'm well, waiting to see if there's any additional questions. And the one question I have for you, um, Dr. Thornberg, is based on what you showed us, and I don't know which slide number it is, but where you are looking at the fusion protein existing this pre-fusion form and post-fusion form and the neutralizing potency, um, would that mean you would hypothesize that nirsevanib would um, potentially be more uh, more protective in a way than pelvizumab has been? Um, I do believe that the that the IC50 of nirsevanib that it's known to be um, uh, higher than pelvizumab. I do believe um, it, it is more potent. It has more potent neutralizing activity. Whether that means it's more effective, I think that needs to, you know, that that, that will be for the trials to determine. Um, but yes, I would expect it to be a more potent, at least in in a laboratory setting, more potent. Okay. And then just, um, and you might have mentioned this, but when I, when infection uh, becomes established in an individual who might have received monoclonal antibody, um, you know, are you anticipating more of the pre-fusion or the post-fusion state? Um, I'm assuming, for example, the pre-fusion state would be mm. ideal, but is that where it would be most effective? And is that how it is presented uh, when it establishes infection? Yes, I should have mentioned that. The pre-fusion state is most likely what it looks like on, on a virus, on a viral particle when you're infected in the post, it triggers to a, it's hypothesized that it's triggered to this post-fusion state. Um, just sort of as or just after it's entered a cell. So um, it's hypothesized that your immune system is seeing the fusion protein um, in a state that looks more like pre-fusion than post-fusion. Thank you. Any additional questions for Dr. Thornburg? Um, well, thank you, Dr. Thornberg. You know, we really, really appreciate um, you providing this uh, deeper pathophysiologic understanding of um, potential vaccine products we might be seeing in the near future. So we'll move on to the uh, epidemiology of RSV in children with Dr. Meredith McMorrow. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Good afternoon. On behalf of my colleagues here at CDC, it's my honor to provide a brief introduction to respiratory syncytial virus seasonality in the United States and the burden of RSV in children. Next slide. First, an introduction to RSV seasonality in the US. Next slide. The CDC's National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Sy system, Surveillance System, or NERVS, is our primary source for monitoring RSV seasonality in the US. It is a passive laboratory-based surveillance system that includes commercial, hospital, and state and local public health laboratories. Approximately 300 laboratories routinely report RSV results. They provide weekly reporting of the total tests performed for RSV and RSV positive tests to monitor real-time virus circulation. All test types are reported, and in recent years, the majority of tests are PCR assays. Testing is primarily clinician-directed and includes persons of all ages. Next slide. This graph shows normalized RSV detections by epidemiologic week from NERVS. During 2011 to 2020, RSV circulation was highly seasonal in the U.S. with predictable peak activity during December to February annually. Next slide. Using NERVS data in blue, excluding Alaska, Florida, and Hawaii, we assess geographic differences in RSV seasonality in the U.S in the three seasons preceding the COVID-19 pandemic. A threshold of a tenfold increase of our baseline was applied to calculate median seasonal onset, which is denoted by small circles in the figure, the peak shown as a triangle, and the offset or N weeks, which are the squares at the end of the lines in the figure, over three seasons from July 17th through June 2020. Using this method, the onset of the RSV season in the US overall Northeast and Midwest census regions was in late October. Typical onset was approximately one week earlier in the South region and approximately two weeks later in the West region. Seasonal peaks and offsets were also earlier in the South and later in the West. We also compared RSV seasonality from nerves to pediatric hospitalizations in children aged less than two years 
from seven pediatric medical centers across the U.S. that form the New Vaccine Surveillance Network, or NVSN, in the lower dashed green line. The onset of RSV-associated hospitalizations in NVSN was one week after the U.S. onset, peaked in mid-December, and ended two to three weeks earlier than the U.S. average. The seasonality of RSV may be different in Florida, Hawaii, and Alaska, where seasons may start earlier, later, or maybe longer than the U.S. average. Next slide. Although there are slight differences in onset, peak, and offset across U.S. census regions, peak RSV transmission in the U.S. in all regions occurs on average during December to February, and more than 90% of RSV detections reported in NERVs occurred during, during the four pre-pandemic seasons occurred between November 1 and March 31st. Next slide. The COVID-19 pandemic interrupted seasonal circulation of RSV and many other respiratory viruses. Following over a year of limited RSV circulation, the U.S. experienced an intraseasonal RSV wave, shown here in blue, that peaked in early August 2021. That peak continued through the fall into late December, as shown in yellow. And although nationally RSV circulation has remained near interseasonal baseline, we are currently seeing increased RSV circulation in HHS regions 4 and 6. These increases may be limited or may herald another atypical RSV season. However, we anticipate that RSV circulation will eventually return to typical winter seasonality. Next slide. And now a brief overview of the burden of RSV in U.S. children. Next slide. RSV infection is the leading cause of hospitalization in U.S. infants. Most infants are infected in the first year of life and nearly all by age two. Approximately 40% of infected infants will develop a lower respiratory tract infection called bronchiolitis, among whom three to 5% will require hospitalization. Premature infants born at less than 30 weeks gestation have hospitalization rates three times higher than term infants. Preterm infants also have higher rates of ICU admission and mechanical ventilation than term infants. And the average cost of hospitalization in infants less than 29 weeks gestation is about four times higher than for a term infant. Although prematurity is an important risk factor for hospitalization, RSV is also the leading cause of hospitalization in healthy term infants. An estimated 79% of children hospitalized with RSV aged less than two years had no underlying medical conditions. In short, all young infants are at risk of severe RSV, and 2 to 3% of all infants will be hospitalized for RSV in the first year of life. Next slide. We estimate that each year in U.S. children aged less than five years, RSV is associated with 100 to 300 deaths, 58,000 to 80,000 hospitalizations, 520,000 emergency department visits, and approximately 1.5 million outpatient visits. Next slide. Estimates of RSV-associated hospitalization rates vary by year, study design, and assumptions. An industry-sponsored systematic review published earlier this year estimated a median annual rate of 25.6 per thousand infants aged 0 to 5 months across 25 studies. This rate included four studies with a single year of hospital data and five studies with two years of data. Rates were imputed, not directly reported, from all but nine studies, and median estimates varied considerably based upon methods with the lowest estimates derived from active surveillance and the highest from modeling studies. Clear outliers were not excluded from calculations. For cost-effectiveness analyses, CDC will use estimates from active surveillance in primary analyses, and other estimates will inform sensitivity analyses. Next slide. CDC generates RSV-associated disease burden estimates from the New Vaccine Surveillance Network, or NVSN. NVSN conducted year-round acute respiratory illness surveillance at three sites during 2000 to 2009 and expanded to seven sites during 2016 to 2021. These same seven sites have continued prospective surveillance in inpatient ED and outpatient clinics. Following enrollment, 
Respiratory samples are collected and undergo PCR testing for multiple respiratory viruses, including RSV. Population denominators and market share are used to estimate disease burden, including hospitalization rates per 100,000 population. Next slide. From NBSN data, we have consistently demonstrated in two four-year surveillance periods that RSV-associated hospitalization rates are highest in children aged 0 to 5 months and decrease with increasing age. In this graph, published NVSN hospitalization rates from 2000 to 2004, seen here in red, and recent unpublished NVSN estimates from 2016 to 2020, in light yellow, demonstrate consistency in estimates from the two time periods. Rates in infants aged 0 to 5 months are slightly higher in the initial surveillance period, and rates in infants aged 6 to 11 months, young children aged 12 to 23 months, and children aged 24 to 59 months are slightly higher in the more recent surveillance period. The overall rate in children aged 0 to 5, 59 months, or those under 5 years, is consistent across the two surveillance period with over, overlapping confidence limits. Next slide. NVSN data have also been used to develop estimates of emergency department and outpatient clinic visits. As with hospitalization rates, the highest ED rates have typically been seen in the youngest infants. In one surveillance period, rates were nearly equal among infants aged 0 to 5 months and those aged 6 to 11 months. In the second study period, 2004 to 2009, the highest rates of ED visits were in infants aged 0 to 5 months. Outpatient clinic rates were highest in slightly older infants aged 6 to 11 months in both surveillance periods. Next slide. A closer look at RSV-associated hospitalization rates in children aged 0 to 11 months demonstrate that the highest incidence of RSV-associated hospitalization occurs in infants aged 1 and 2 months and then decreases with increasing age. Because of the high incidence of severe disease in the first months of life, RSV prevention products have focused on maternal immunization and immunoprophylaxis with monoclonal antibodies. Next slide. Palavizumab, also known by the trade name Synergis, is the only RSV prevention product currently licensed in the United States. It is a humanized monoclonal IgG antibody targeting antigenic site 2 of the F or fusion glycoprotein. It requires monthly administration due to its short half-life. Initial clinical trials demonstrated 55% efficacy against RSV-associated hospitalization in preterm infants and infants with chronic lung disease, and 45% efficacy against RSV-associated hospitalization in infants with congenital heart disease. Currently, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends its use in infants less than 29 weeks gestation during the first year of life, preterm infants with chronic lung disease, infants with hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease, and infants with profound immune compromise. This recommendation means that approximately 5% of U.S. infants are eligible for immunoprophylaxis with Synergis. However, data suggest only 2% of the annual birth cohort receive one or more doses. There's currently no ACIP recommendation on the use of palivizumab. Next slide. In conclusion, pre-tent pandemic RSV seasonality is well-defined with limited geographic variability in most of the United States. RSV is the most common cause of hospitalization in U.S. infants. The highest hospitalization rates are in the first months of life and risk declines with increasing age in early childhood. Prematurity and other chronic diseases increase risk of RSV-associated hospitalization, but most hospitalizations are in healthy term infants. The only currently licensed prevention product targets only 5% of U.S. infants. There are new RSV prevention candidates targeting infants in late stages of development, including one product that will be introduced by the manufacturer today. Next slide. I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of many colleagues to this presentation, especially the members of the ACIP Maternal Pediatric RSV Working Group and our NERVs and NBSN collaborators. Next slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Would you like to open up for questions now on this presentation, Dr. McMorrow? Th 
that would be fine. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to go through, through the adults as well. All right, this presentation is now open for questions. Ms. Bata? Thank you. Um, just a, a question um, about the, the rates and any speculation about why we see higher rates in the 2016 to 2020 season. So um, the rates overall in uh, children under five were, uh, there was no statistically significant difference. Um, there was a slight increase in the 16 to 20 seasons, but those were before the pandemic in the older age groups, not um, in the youngest infants. Um, and again, they were slight increases of about 10%, um, not, not um, statistically significant, but not um, considerably different. Um, and then in the 2021 atypical circulation, we did again see slightly higher rates of circulation after more than a year without activity. Thank you. Any additional questions? Um, Dr. McMorrow, uh, one question for me would be, uh, you had mentioned that 5% are eligible, but 2% receive uh, immunoprophylaxis. Would you have any information on whether or not there are disparities or equity issues in relation to access to th uh, therapies? Um, and would that data be available from any of the data sources that you're aware of? I think it would be helpful for us going forward. So most Medicaid eligible children, um, the state does provide that to children who meet those qualifications. Um, so I suspect that um, that the children who are are not being targeted are on the edge of aging out um, uh, of eligibility. Um, and I suspect that many of our ACIP colleagues are also aware of of barriers, but. Often, because uh, of the cost of this product, um, there, there are important barriers and there are centralized clinics to maximize the, the distribution and utility of the product um, that often limit uh, its, its broader availability um, in the general pediatric office. Thank you. I don't see any additional hands raised. So why don't we move to um, the next presentation from uh, Dr. Fiona Havers on the epidemiology of RSV in adults. And uh, Dr. Morrow, if you're available afterwards in case there are additional questions, that would be terrific. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. My name is Dr. Fiona Havers and I'm a, I'm a off medical officer in the respiratory viruses branch in the Division of Viral Diseases. Next slide. Today, I'm going to be speaking on the epidemi epidemiology and burden of RSV in older adults. You just heard about the burden of RSV in children, but I'm going to go over some of the epidemiologic data in adults and put it in context with comparing the burden of RSV with influenza and also talk about the impact of comorbidities on risk of RSV and severe outcomes. Next slide. Next slide. RSV is a frequent cause of severe respiratory illness in older adults. While it is well recognized by pediatricians, there is lower awareness of RSV in adults among healthcare providers and the public. RSV is underdetected as RSV testing is often not performed, even in hospitalized adults. This is understandable because there's currently no vaccine or recommended treatment in most RSV cases. Next slide. Even though it is often not recognized as a cause of illness in adults, and there are gaps in recent epidemiologic data for RSV, we do know that the burden of disease in older adults is substantial. This pyramid shows estimates of RSV burden, from which from the bottom up shows estimates of 2.2 million symptomatic illnesses per year, approximately 177,000 hospitalizations and 14,000 deaths in those 65 years and older. Next slide. Here's the pyramid that I just showed you, focusing on just the top two sections, and includes the numbers of hospitalizations and deaths in children less than five years 
using the pyramid on the right, which is the one that you just saw in Dr. McMorrow's presentation. Here you can see that even though RSV is often thought of as more of a pediatric disease, in terms of numbers of hospitalizations and deaths, the burden in older adults is very high. Next slide. RSV is a frequent cause of pneumonia in hospitalized adults. This was shown in one large study, the Etiology of Pneumonia in the Community Study, or EPIC study, which was a multi-center study of patients hospitalized with a community-acquired pneumonia. For patients who met study criteria, extensive testing for multiple pathogens was undertaken. The study found that RSV, highlighted in the red box, is a leading cause of community-acquired pneumonia. RSV was detected in 3% of adults hospitalized with pneumonia, although it should be noted that in this study, 62% of patients had no pathogen detected. And other studies have shown the proportion of those with pneumonia that have RSV to be higher. Regardless, RSV was the fifth most commonly detected pathogen of all types in adults hospitalized with community-acquired pneumonia. Next slide. As I mentioned, there are gaps in estimates of RSV disease burden in, in older adults, and estimates vary by study design and, and can vary widely. However, this sh slide shows estimates from studies looking at the in incidence of RSV among hospitalized patients with annual estimates of hospitalizations per 100,000 population. The first two studies presented are population-based, multi-season estimates from hospitalized patients who were tested for RSV, and the third uses nat national syndromic and hospital data to estimate RSV incidence. Despite differing methodologies, all these studies demonstrate a high annual incidence of RSV hospitalization particularly in patients aged 65 years and older. Next slide. RSV also causes a substantial burden of outpatient disease in adults also. The data on this slide shows rates of medically attended visits for RSV in adults 60 years and older, over 10 seasons. In this study, investigators tested patients who presented to outpatient clinics with acute respiratory infections and found that among those, 11% had RSV. Among those with RSV, 19% had a serious outcome, which the investigators defined as hospitalization, emergency department visit, or pneumonia. Note that there are two lines on this chart, with the higher dashed line showing rates in those with underlying cardiopulmonary disease. Rates were nearly two times higher among patients with chronic cardiopulmonary disease compared to those without these underlying diseases. The bottom line is the total population. And as you can see, the, ra the rates are substantially higher in those with underlying cardiopulmonary disease. Next slide. Among adults 65 years and older in the United States, RSV is associated with a somewhat similar burden of disease as influenza. And I, to put RSV burden in context, I put the, the pyramid that I showed earlier with RSV on the left and published estimates for influenza on the right in blue. For influenza, the data shows the range of point estimates for the 2015-16 through 2019-20 seasons. The burden of disease varies annually for both RSV and influenza. And as I mentioned, there is limited recent data on RSV burden. Generally speaking, however, based on these estimates, the burden of RSV in older adults for illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths are in a similar range as those for influenza. Note, of course, that influenza has a widely used vaccine, and without this vaccine, the burden of influenza would be much higher. Next slide. Data from other studies have demonstrated similar RSV and in in, in influenza hospitalization rates in older adults. These data are from one of the studies I showed earlier, which over three seasons found that among a population that is highly vaccinated with influenza vaccine, um, um, drawing from that population, these hospitalized patients, the, this study is in hospitalized patients who have acute respiratory illnesses who were tested for both pathogens. Among these patients, 6.1% had RSV and 6.5% had, influ had influenza, with similar rates for both pathogens, as shown on the graph. Of note, investigators found that hospitalized patients with RSV had clinical outcomes that were as or more severe than those hospitalized with influenza, as measured by length of stay, ICU admission, and mechanical ventilation or death. Next slide. I'm now going to switch to talking a little bit more about clinical outcomes and comorbid conditions. Next slide. 
The next few slides show data from RSVNet, a population-based surveillance network that covers 8.6% of the U.S. population in 12 states shown on the slide here. All cases included have a laboratory-confirmed RSV-associated hospitalization based on clinician-driven testing. Next slide. We found that in RSVNet, among adult, adults hospitalized with RSV over three seasons, almost all, 94%, have an underlying condition, with nearly half having three or more conditions. Cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, and diabetes were the three most frequent underlying medical conditions seen in these approximately 5,000 patients. Again, these were among patients who had clinician-directed testing and patients who, with underlying medical conditions may be more likely to be tested for RSV than those who do not have underlying conditions. But the proportion of patients hospitalized for RSV who have comorbid conditions is very high. Next slide. Comorbid conditions greatly increase the risk of hospitalization from RSV. One condition that clearly increases risk is congestive heart failure. This slide from a published study with RSVNet data shows population-based rates of RSV-associated hospitalizations among patients with congestive heart failure in blue and those without in orange. Rates for all adults 18 years and older are on the left, less than 65 is in the middle, and those greater than 65 is on the right. Overall, 28% of hospitalized RSV cases had our CHF, and hospitalization rates were eight times higher in patients with congestive heart failure compared to those without. The difference, the difference between the groups was larger in those who were 50 to 64 at 14 times higher rates in those with CHF compared to those without in that age range. This is compared to those who are 65 and older who had rates 3.5 times higher in those with CHF compared to those without. Next slide. Immunocompromised adults are also at increased risk of severe disease from RSV, including, including lower respiratory tract infections, ICU admission, and death. The greatest risk is among lung, lung transplants, lung transplant and hemopoietic cell transplant patients, as well as other immunocompromised populations, such, such as those receiving chemotherapy for leukemia or lymphoma. Incidence of symptomatic illness is high in some of these groups. For example, in two prospective studies of lung transplant patients, the incidence of symptomatic RSV illness was 12% over a two-year period and 16% over a single season, respectively. Severe outcomes are frequently seen in immunocompromised patients with RSV infection. Progression to lower respiratory tract illness is very common, and mortality can be very high. For example, in one study of hemopoietic cell transplant patients, mortality was 26% in those with lower respiratory tract infection due to RSV. Next slide. In addition, long-term care facility residents are another population that are vulnerable to RSV infection. It is a frequent cause of respiratory illnesses in this population, and it is well, document, well documented as a cause of severe outbreaks in long-term care facilities. For example, one study showed that 13.5% of all residents of a single facility has symptomatic PCR-confirmed illness in a single month during an outbreak. RSV and long-term care facilities also contribute substantial bur disease burden and cost to the healthcare system. In an industry-sponsored study using Medicare data to estimate RSV attributable hospitalizations among long-term care facility residents, the authors estimated that these cost more than $50 million per year, with an average length of stay of 5.3 days per hospitalization, and with a cumulative hospital stay days of more than 32,000 days per year. Next slide. So the last few slides have talked about specific populations that are at high risk for severe RSV disease. Overall, however, among all adults hospitalized with RSV, a large proportion are severely ill, as measured by the proportion admitted to the ICU and the proportion who died. In these RSV net data from over three seasons, we see that about 19% of all hospital, of hospitalized adults of all ages are admitted to the ICU and 4% died. The mortality was highest in those 65 years and older at 5%. 
However, note that the proportion admitted to the ICU was high even in younger patients ages 18 to 49, like, likely reflecting that younger patients hospitalized with RSV are likely to have underlying conditions that make them more vulnerable to severe outcomes. Next slide. In addition, RSV leads to exacerbations of underlying chronic disease and long-term sequelae, including contributing to acute myocardial infarctions, to strokes, to exacerbations of asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which can result in long a long-term decline in respiratory function. And there can be other long-term sequelae from RSV illnesses. Next slide. I did want to touch briefly on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the RSV on RSV in adults. These data are from RSVNet from 2014 through 2022, with the pre-pandemic seasons, which generally go from October through April in blue, and the 2020-2021 season shown in red, and the more recent data of the 2021-2022 season in orange. As you can see, and as you saw in Dr. McMorrow's presentation, there was very abnormal circulation during the pandemic, with almost no RSV-associated hospitalizations in the first year and an atypical surge in summer and fall 2021. We are continuing to monitor whether there are long-term impacts on RSV circulation from the pandemic that will affect the burden of disease in adults. Next slide. So in summary, I want to emphasize that RSV is a major cause of severe illness in older adults. It is a frequent but often unrecognized cause of severe respiratory illnesses in this population. The burden of disease is comparable to that of influenza with some variability across seasons. Adults with comorbidities, including immunocompromised adults and long-term care facility residents are among those at risk for severe, severe illness. A high proportion of those hospitalized with RSV have severe outcomes, including ICU admission and death, and RSV illness can result in long-term health consequences. Next slide. There are a number of people I'd like to acknowledge um, for this talk, and especially the ACIP RSV Adult Work Group, who had very, very useful input. Um, but I am now open for questions. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you so much, Dr. Havers. And this presentation is now open for questions. Ms. McNally. Thank you for both of these presentations about the um, childhood impact of RSV and in, in, in adults. I am interested in understanding household transmission rates from household contacts, brothers, sisters, parents, um, and then obviously to grandparents. But I'm specifically thinking about the fact that, you know, these kids can have RSV more than once, and the symptoms they experience the second time or third time around, my understanding is it can be less severe. So a runny nose in a, in a five-year-old could be very dangerous to an infant. And I just want to confirm my understanding of that and then just check on those household contact rates. Thank you. Yes, hi. So um, there have been limited household transmission studies uh, of RSV in children, um, but uh, approximately the attack rate in household transmission studies varies and is likely about 20%, but is age uh, is differential by age. So in younger children, it can be 45 or 50 percent, and in older adults, it may be less. You are correct in your assumption and understanding that um, the, the second and third infection in later childhood tend to be considerably less severe and that have a lower risk of um, lower respiratory tract infection and uh, associated sequelae. I think that covered the two questions, but please let me know if there's something else. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's also important for maybe parents to understand that it's largely, is it correct to, to say that it's largely supportive care for infants who get sick and that they will, there is not really um, always treatment that's going to, to improve the symptoms once they arrive to the hospital. Yes, that's correct. There's no current, um, therapy specific to RSV that, that's widely used and is highly effective. That is correct. Thank you. So from the consumer's perspective, I'm really 
um, happy to see that there's been positive development for an RSV vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNally. Any other questions? You must have been very clear in your two presentations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Havers and um, Dr. McMorrow. Um, we'll move on to the next presentation uh, by Dr. Christian Felter from Sanofi. Uh, who will be speaking about the safety and efficacy of nirsevimab in infants. And hopefully I said that correctly, <laughs> Dr. Felter. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Lee, and yes, you did. My name is Dr. Christian Tillen Felter, and I'm here representing Sanofi. I am joined here by Dr. Tanya Villafana, representing AstraZeneca, and I will be discussing nirsevimab for the prevention of RSV disease in all infants. Next slide, please. So nirsevimab is being brought forward through a collaboration between Sanofi and AstraZeneca, and you can see the joint responsibilities that we share here on this slide. Next slide, please. As already stated by Dr. McMurrow, RSV is the leading cause of hospitalization in infants under the age of one. This is true whether the child is born premature or term, or if they're born in April or December. Despite this, the current approach to RSV prevention in infants is a risk-based one, which means that 98% of infants do not get prevention for RSV. There are many reasons for this, such as the feasibility of the implementation of a large-scale RSV prevention program. But what is clear is that what is being done today is not addressing the needs of a majority of infants. Next slide, please. We are now, however, on the cusp of a new era where protection from RSV can be made available to all infants. To realize this vision, we know that several conditions have to be met. Helpfully, the WHO has told us what some of these conditions are. First, it's going to be a product that's going to be, need to be indicated for the prevention of RSV disease in the first year of life, ensuring that severe disease is examined. Secondly, the primary target population aims to protect most infants during their first RSV season. Third, a single dose must provide protection from birth. Four, safety that is akin to other vaccines that are given at birth. And fifth, efficacy of at least 70% against severe disease and protection for at least five months. Next slide, please. When we look in the United States, more than half a million infants receive medical attention for an RSV, lower respiratory tract infection, each year. And most of those cases are in infants that were healthy and born at term. In addition, RSV does not discriminate based on when an infant was born, as it remains the leading cause of hospitalization, regardless of when they were born. It is here that we turn to nirsevimab. Nirsevimab is a recombinant monoclonal antibody that is targeted at the RSV F protein in its pre-fusion conformation, and it has a modification to the FC region that prolongs the half-life, making it possible to prevent RSV throughout the entirety of the RSV season with a single dose by tripling the half-life of the antibody. Next slide, please. The nirsevimab clinical development program consists of three pivotal studies that, when taken together, span the entirety of the infant population. The most recent study is the MELODY study, which looked at the safety and efficacy of nirsevimab in late preterm and healthy term infants. The phase 2b study, noted here, examined the safety and efficacy of the product in the early preterm infants that are not currently eligible for palivizumab, and the program completed its look at all infants with the MEDLEY study, which was a head-to-head -head safety and pharmacokinetic study in the palivizumab eligible population, which included children with chronic lung disease of prematurity or congenital heart disease. Next slide, please. So 
Medley and the phase 2B study that both looked at the efficacy of nirsevimab had nearly identical study designs, with the notable exception that the Melody study extended its surveillance through the second RSV season. The primary endpoint of both of these studies was the relative reduction in the incidence of medically attended lower respiratory tract infection caused by RT-PCR confirmed RSV at five months. The secondary endpoints were the relative reduction in hospitalization, as well as safety, pharmacokinetics, and anti-drug antibodies. Infants in the phase 2B study received either nirsevimab, 50 milligrams, or placebo. The phase 2B study results informed the dosing in the Melody study, where those under 5 kilograms received 50 milligrams, and those above 5 kilograms received 100. Because of the complementary populations and the match study designs, we plan to look at the pooled efficacy of these two studies to show the effect of nirsevimab in all infants not eligible for palivizumab. Next slide, please. Now, turning to COVID, as has been discussed, with so many things, COVID had an immense, although indirect, impact on RSV circulation. The lockdowns and the use of non-pharmaceutical interventions for the prevention of COVID reduced the circulation of RSV to near zero in early 2020. Melody, the Melody study began in July of 2019 and enrolled 1,027 subjects in the 2019 Northern Hemisphere RSV season. The study continued into the Southern Hemisphere where 462 subjects were enrolled in South Africa, but there were no cases in either arm. Since it couldn't be predicted when RSV circulation would resume, the trial was paused and discussions with the FDA were undertaken, and it was agreed that the 1,490 subjects enrolled before the pause be evaluated as the primary efficacy cohort, later noted as cohort one in the slides to come. As we have seen, RSV circulation has since resumed, as has the Melody trial, which has now completed its enrollment of the second cohort to get to the originally planned 3,000 subjects. And the evaluation of the safety and efficacy data is ongoing, with publication expected before the end of this year. Next slide, please. Here in this table, you can see the results of the first cohort of the Medley study, as I just discussed, as well as the results of the phase 2B study and the top line results of the Medley study. In both the Melody and the phase 2B, the primary efficacy endpoint was the relative reduction in me medically attended lower respiratory tract infection caused by RSV. You can see in the Melody, the result was a 74.5% reduction. This is similar to what was seen in the phase 2B study. It is important to note that, as I mentioned earlier, in the phase 2B studies, all subjects were given nirsevimab uh, 50 milligrams regardless of their weight. When analyzing the pharmacokinetics along with the efficacy results, it was clear that those over five kilograms needed a higher dose, and this is what was taken into the, into the Melody study, where those above five kilograms received 100 milligrams. So that explains the data that you can see there. The secondary endpoint reported here for both study was hospitalization due to RSV LRTI. You will see a strong result in the phase 2B, but a non-significant result in the Melody study. But it is important to note that this was due to underpowering due to the study interruption, and the full data set will be forthcoming shortly. And these studies are, are meant to and were not planned to be taken in isolation. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned previously, the phase 2B and Melody study were essentially two halves of the same study, one looking at the preterm infants and the other at term. The study designs were similar and, e similar and equally important, nirsevimab being the protection itself rather than the stimulation of protection, functions, the same in, in, functions in the same manner regardless of gestational age by directly blocking the entry of RSV at the cellular level. For those reasons, and because the product is designed to be used in all infants and not in one particular subpopulation, the studies were combined based on a pre-specified analysis plan which I'm going to be showing you now. Next slide, please. As I stated in the introduction, the WHO has said that efficacy against severe RSV disease must be examined and efficacy proven. In this table, 
You can see the results of the combined analysis when the efficacy of nirsevimab is examined in all cases of RSV lower respiratory tract infections, as well as the subgroup of all LRTIs that resulted in hospitalization and those that were classified as very severe, meaning that the infant required supplemental oxygen or intravenous fluids. You will see here the beginning of a pattern, and that, the pa that pattern is that the efficacy is consistent regardless of the subpopulation that is being examined. This is in line with the mechanism of action of the product, which does not rely on the generation of an immune response, but rather on the direct protection of the infant. Next slide, please. Here in this slide, you can see the pattern continues. As was shown on the previous slide, the top line of this table shows the efficacy of nirsevimab against all medically attended RSV lower respiratory tract infections. That efficacy figure is 79.5%. If you draw a line down from that point, which has been done here, you can see that regardless of how you examine the data, the answer is essentially the same. It does not matter if you're looking at age at randomization, geography, or gender. The re result remains the same. Next slide, please. Another important factor when evaluating any potential protection from RSV is the durability of that protection. Here you can see a graph that shows the protection for, uh, from the nirsevimab is consistent across the five months of a normal RSV season, and that at five months, the curves are continuing to diverge. And there is now additional data that suggests protection lasts beyond these five months. Next slide, please. While a great deal of focus is rightfully put on RSV hospitalization, it's important to look at the burden that RSV presents in the outpatient setting as well. Here in this chart, you can see the impact of nirsevimab on outpatient visits for all cause medically attended LRTI in the infants from the Melody study. We also looked at the number of antibiotics prescribed over the season and found that those children receiving nirsevimab had received less courses of antibiotics over the the season regardless of indication. It is perhaps because nirsevimab prevents the bacterial infections that may be associated with RSV, or it is because these children seek medical attention less frequently and hence less overprescribing. Next slide, please. And here we can see the safety of nirsevimab when compared to placebo in the case of the phase 2b and melody, or to palivizumab in medley. The populations in the Melody study were separated into a preterm cohort and a CHD CLD cohort. Overall, nirsevimab has a favorable safety profile and one that is comparable to placebo or palivizumab, depending on the study being looked at. None of the serious adverse events or deaths were considered by the investigators to be related to the product. And with regards to hypersensitivity, there was one case of a cutaneous reaction to nirsevimab in the Melody study. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, RSV represents a significant yearly burden on the healthcare system in the United States and is the leading cause of hospitalization in infants regardless of the month of birth. Severe RSV disease is unpredictable with most medically attended cases occurring in healthy infants born at term. This means that despite all infants being at risk of RSV disease, currently only 2% are being protected. All infants need direct protection from RSV regardless of their gestational age or when they were born. Nirsevimab is designed to be that protection for all infants. And today I have shown you that across three major clinical trials that when taken together, demonstrate the efficacy of the product of preventing RSV in all infants with more data being available uh, with, from the complete, that will complete the story in the near future. It has also been shown to have a safe, favorable safety profile across all three studies and is designed to be easily implemented with a single injection, either at birth or alongside routine infant immunization. And with that, I will stop and see if there are any questions, and thank you very much. Thank you. This presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Paling. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Felter, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I've got a couple questions. First, can you tell us how this um, is administered in the dose volume? 
I'll turn that question over to my colleague, Dr. Abilifov. Yeah, so the 50 mg dose is half a mil and the 100 mg dose is um, one mil, and this will be as a pre filled syringe. And what is the route of administration, please? Oh, it's I am, sorry. <laughs> I, I missed okay. that. Too. All right. Okay, thank you. And when we compared it to placebo, what was the placebo? The placebo in the studies was saline. This is Dr. Filipana again. Okay, wonderful. Um, and then um, I don't remember my last question, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Feel free to come back. Dr. Sanchez. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, and certainly, we really do need a product like yours um, for prevention of, of severe RSV and medically attended RSV. So um, this is very exciting um, news and presentation. Um, my a couple, a few questions. First of all, um, I don't believe you defined a medically attended low respiratory tract infection, and or if you did, I, I may have missed it. So if you could uh, provide that. And along with that, um, one of the slides suggested that severe RSV infection was oxygen requirement or was that also hospitalization? And I guess I, I'd like to know a little bit more of the definitions that were used for the trial outcomes. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanchez. If we could go to the backup slide 20. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Leach, who can go through this and your other questions. Thank you so much. Just checking that um, you can hear me. We yes. can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the case definition of medically attended RSV LRCI. Well, all of these uh, children were presenting uh, for medical care. Uh, they were RSV confirmed by a central laboratory uh, PCR assay. We uh, ensured that they had low respiratory tract involvement by chest examination looking for um, a clinical sign. And we also uh, made sure that each of these children had at least one uh, sign of clinical severity. Um, these are listed here on this slide and include uh, raised respiratory rate and hypoxemia, as well as um, a list of other symptoms. Um, the question also uh, referred to the case definition that we used for very severe. And these were a subset of the children who were admitted to hospital. Um, and they were the subset of children who um, either required oxygen during their hospital stay or required IV uh, fluid. I hope that addresses the question. Yes, thank you. Um, and then the other question was that, if I remember correctly, the um, Melody trial enrolled eight months of age or less. So most of these infants, um, at least in the late preterm and term, were less than eight. And um, you know, Sorry. Yes, so um, the children were all uh, enrolled uh, prior to the RSV season. Um, so actually in the Melody trial, there wasn't a restriction uh, to enroll uh, less than eight months. Uh, we did do that in our earlier trial in the premature infant. Um, but just for practical uh, reasons, most of the children uh, who were enrolled into the trial were younger than eight months, and actually the median age was two months of age. Yeah, because I think in one of your slides, it's actually the great majority of them were less than three months of age, so there were very few in the older age range. Yes, that's correct. Well, I would say maybe not very few in the older age group, but uh, as a percentage, yes. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. I, ha I had sort of a related question, which was um, 
and, and this is in response to, to a comment that you made about vaccination at birth or within the first two months of age, what was the distribution of age at vaccination, not just the median, but the distribution, or another way to ask it is how many of those kids were in that, you know, birth through two months of age. Um, and then I have a second question, but I'll start, start there. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Leach. Thank you. Um, we've been, um, in terms of how many uh, healthy neonates that we have enrolled to our trials, um, in the primary analyses that we've reported to date, uh, those data include more than uh, 500 um, neonates who would have been randomized to either nisevimab or to Comparator. And of course, as we go forward, we have additional data that will be coming in to support this in our ongoing Melody trial. And you're defining neonate as? Um, Less than 28 days okay. of age. Yes. Okay, great. Thing. And that's true for the preterm babies too, that they were getting nursivimab within the first 28 days of life. So let's say a 32 weeker or something. Absolutely. Well, um, we in in the two trials that we have, Melody and Medley, uh, we essentially enrolled the preterm trial was less than 35 weeks gestational age, and the late preterm and term was 35 weeks gestational age and above. And we definitely had uh, neonates in substantial numbers in both trials. What I can't confirm for you was that they were uh, 32 weeks, uh, but they were less than 35 weeks. Yeah, and sorry, I, I just meant that as an as an example. So that that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and then my second question was time of year at vaccination. Um, what's known about vaccinating in the spring for protection the following season? I realize it's all incredibly complicated due to the COVID pandemic, but but what's known about vaccinating eight months before the typical respiratory season. Thank you. Well, all of our trials actually were designed to immunize prior to the RSV season. Um, so the uh, data we have presented here uh, is actually censored after five months when we examined our primary endpoint. Um, serendipitously in uh, the COVID uh, epidemic, what we saw was RSV uh, disappear, and we had actually immunized uh, quite a large number of 500 children in South Africa who we were able to follow. There was no RSV season that appeared, uh, and then uh, when RSV reemerged uh, after five months of follow-up, um, we saw an indication of uh, protection in those children. It wasn't statistically significant, but it was a very intriguing observation. We go to slide 19, it will show that data, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Sanchez, to answer your question, if we can go to slide 18 as well, uh, it will show you the demographic uh, breakdown. It'll give you an idea of the gestational age by groups right there. So th this is available in the backup slides. And to answer one other question that was uh, stated before, when regard regarding medically attended, we're talking about sought medical attention either at, at the uh, doctor's office, emergency room, or were hospitalized. So all of those three would be considered medically attended in this in this context. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brooks. Yes, um, and thank you for the presentation. Could you go forward one slide again to slide 19, where you just were? So these children you followed out for almost a year, and this, I guess this is a subset. Did you follow the, the children in the other study, uh, what, two or three, I believe it is, uh, in 204? out a year, but I, or did I just hear that you followed them out five months? Dr. Leach? Thank you. Um, all children will have been or are in the process of being followed up uh -huh. for a year. Um, 
but our, I think what I was trying to say was that our primary efficacy endpoint that we will port is over the five month period, which is anticipated to be the duration of a typical season. All right. Well, just because I had the same question as uh, Dr. Daly, if the child got vaccinated, let's say in March, would they be protected through to, let's say, April or um, you know, of the next year where the season may be ending? So this data implies that they would be, but you're saying that's ongoing at this point. We are following all the children in the clinical studies up for a full year of protection. We will have more um, information on uh, duration of protection beyond the five-month period. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stafford, did you have another question? Yes. Thank you. I think, first of all, we need to clarify that this is not a vaccine or that we're not immunizing any children, um, first of all. Just a clarification. Um, because, and then, um, but my other question is, as we envision, you know, if this product does, be, does get the FDA approval, um, is how, yeah, go on. Did you have comments? No, so my question is, how young were the youngest babies um, medicated? Um, you know, I don't, first of all, they were all at home. They were not in the NICU, or at least they were anticipated discharge. Um, so they did not stay in the NICU for more than, I don't remember exactly. Um, so they were not babies who received medications um, in the NICU uh, for an extended period of time. But also as I envision, you know, um, a newborn who's going home, um, those were not babies who were um, provided the study drug. And what was the youngest that they received the, um, the study medication? Thank you very much for your question, Dr. Sanchez. First of all, yes, you're absolutely correct. This is not a vaccine. It is a passive immunization through a monoclonal antibody. Uh, and that is meant to be given at birth or at the start of the RSV season for those that are born prior to the season. And I will turn it over to Dr. Leach to, uh, to address the question about the young children in the study. Um, our protocols actually allowed for the immunization to be given um, on the first day of life. Um, and we do have a number of children admittedly not many, but a number of children who were dosed uh, on the first day of life. And we have um, um, quite a substantial number of children who were immunized in the first week of life. Oh, thank you. That's really helpful. Dr. Lear? Thank you for this presentation. So if I'm putting timing down, my sense is you're advocating that all babies either born in the hospital in September, October would get it in the hospital, maybe even throughout the winter, if they were born in January, they would get it because it's still RSV season. And all outpatients would also try to get it in that time range, the September, October time range. Is that yeah. an accurate assessment? Thank you for your question, Dr. Lair, and that's exactly correct. It would be for the patients, for the babies that were born before the season, they would be getting it as outpatients in the doctor's clinics. And for those born in season, as close to birth and ideally before discharge from the hospital would be, would be the proposed implementation time to make sure that they got the maximum benefit from the prevention provided. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cotton. I have two comments. My first is, it's interesting that the ACIP is discussing this use of a monoclonal antibody, um, which is somewhat different than has been done in the past, as far as um, I understand, uh, because the ACIP has not taken on things like Evusheld, which is for prevention of COVID-19 and is, uh, has been really, really underutilized. People are confused as far as the recommendations, and I think it's been um, a loss that the CDC and ACIP have not taken that on, but 
now I don't understand exactly why we're looking at a monoclonal antibody for something like RSV. So it's just a little bit of um, confusion there that perhaps um, someone could explain or either, either now or just contemplate. And my second comment would be, um, I've been involved in stewardship of pavulizumab for years. It's phenomenally expensive. So I'm hoping that we'll see a good cost benefit analysis with um, this new monoclonal antibody. Thank you. I'll pause um, if there's any other responses that are needed, but um, I, I do think that, yeah, I'd be curious about the cost as well. Um, thanks for that question. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, can I give, uh, Dr. Uh, hold on. Dr. Paling, did you want to respond or did you have a question? Um, if we have time, I do have a question. I wanted to okay. ask about the safety. I wanted to ask about the grade four event and the deaths that were reported and get more information on that. Okay, thank Why you. Why don't you go ahead and then Dr. Sanchez will end with you and then we'll move on um, to the next question. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, Dr. Leach, please. Yes, certainly. Um, so, um, in total, in the all the pivotal trials, we have seen a total of uh, 14 fatal SEEs. And of those, uh, 10 occurred in the Sevamab recipients, and four were in recipients of uh, placebo. But here we have to remember the two-to-one randomization that we used in all the clinical trials. So essentially, uh, the deaths were balanced by groups. We saw uh, the investigators reported none of them as related to product. And um, overall, our assessment was that uh, the causes of death that were observed were in line uh, with that of the general population in that country or that population and uh, were within the expected uh, mortality rates of that population. I hope that uh, addresses your question. Yes, and then d did you observe any grade uh, four um, adverse events? Dr. Leach or Dr. Felcher? Dr. Leach, did you hear the question? Yes, I did, and I'm, I'm Sorry, but I'm not um, able to respond to that immediately without um, looking back into the data. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, we, we'd appreciate follow-up uh, via written response or at another time uh, on that question. I think, you know, as you can tell, <laughs> if safety members are always concerned about safety. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, Dr. Sanchez, uh, last question. Yes, thank you again. I'm sorry uh, for the multiple questions. But um, my other question was, and I'm glad that you're following at least through a year, but I wonder if longer follow-up may be needed because there's been this so far unproved or just anecdotal um, evidence that, that or anecdotal experience that some following the lack of RSV during the previous season, um, that in a second year of age, some of these children were being hospitalized with, um, with RSV infection and they were older. And I just, um, and I know that that hasn't been confirmed, at least maybe by CDC and others, but there's been this anecdotal experience that um, is still being looked at. Um, it would be important to also know that some of these very high risk premature infants, those with BPD and then even those term babies with uh, complex heart disease and the extremely preterm, like the 23, 24 weekers, that we may get them over their first season, but that they're not coming in with more severe RSV in a second season. So just a comment um, that I would urge you to do longer follow-up in these um, during a second RSV season. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez, for your question. I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Villafana. Yeah, so just to um, just to uh, clarify something. So as Amanda, um, Dr. Leeds said, 
Um, we uh, followed all the kids through uh, day 361, but in the Melody study, and I think Dr. Felter showed this, um, the kids are followed through day uh, for through a second RSV season, yeah. and um, we will have uh, information um, from that uh, second uh, season follow-up uh, to share with the committee later. Um, but we also know, and we have data, and unfortunately it's not included in this presentation, um, but that we do know that children um, do mount an immune response to RSV um, even when they've been dosed uh, with nirsevimab, so they can um, they can have an immune response to, to natural infection. Thank you. Okay, well, I want to thank all of our presenters from the RSV vaccine session um, and doc thank Dr. Cotton and also Dr. Long for their, uh, for their work on these uh, incredibly important topics. Um, we are at the end of the day, I, I believe um, we have one more session left. So if it's okay with everybody, uh, I would like to proceed so that we can call it a week for ACIP after the end of today's session. It's a pretty important session and I wanna make sure we have enough time as well because I know CDC is up against a um, uh, closure on their end. So it is our monkeypox informational session um, and we are very appreciative that our CDC colleagues are willing to come and provide an update um, and hopefully answer any questions that our members do have um, you know, on behalf of all the work that I know our members do as well as the public. So first we'll move to um, Dr. Agam Rao, who will provide a situational update on monkeypox. Dr. Rao. Great, thank you. All right, so some background information about monkeypox. Monkeypox is a rare, sometimes life-threatening zoonotic infection. It's endemic in West and Central Africa. The, it's caused by monkeypox virus, which is an orthopox virus, but the specific animal reservoir for monkeypox virus is unknown. It's probably small mammals, though. It can spread from infected animals to humans and also person to person through respiratory secretions, skin to skin contact with infected bodily fluids like fluid from vesicles and pustules, and through fomites like shared towels and contaminated bedding. So before 2022, there, there have been U.S. cases. In 2003, there was an outbreak linked to small mammals imported from Ghana, and there were 47 cases associated with that outbreak. It, it was a multi-state outbreak involving the upper Midwest United States. The cause was traced to the spread of monkeypox virus from, from imported African rodents to pet prairie dogs, and then to people who had contact with those pet prairie dogs. Then after that, the next time we had cases in the United States was actually just last year. There were two unrelated cases and travelers from Nigeria. The first in July, um, and it was in Texas, and the other one was in November in a patient who is uh, who resides in Maryland. So similar to imported, so um, these cases actually were similar to imported cases that other countries outside of Africa have experienced since 2018. During 2018 to 2021, there were imported cases from travelers returning from Nigeria to the United Kingdom. There was four, Singapore one and Israel one. And all of those again were from uh, travelers from Nigeria. It, um, um, Nigeria experienced a large outbreak in 2018, sorry, in 2017, that, um, that results in, um, in cases continuing to occur afterwards. So there was decades of no cases in Nigeria. And then in 2017, there was this outbreak so the, the, the pictures that I have on these slides are what we've thought about as classic lesions before 2022. So the two pictures on the top part of this slide are photographs from um, patients involved in the 2003 U.S. monkeypox outbreak. These were, um, these were due to bites and scratches for the most part, and you can see that they are firm, well-circumscribed, deep-seated lesions. The, the photographs on the bottom side of this slide are the photographs that you've probably commonly seen associated with endemic countries, and they are large lesions, they are hard to miss, um, and they are, again, firm, um, well-circumscribed and deep-seated lesions that are painful. Now, everything changed, though. In May of 2022, the United Kingdom had cases in three distinct clusters that they announced on May 7th, 14th, and 16th. 
Um, the first one was a travel associated case uh, from a traveler. So again, it sounded like it was similar to some of the other cases that we have seen outside of um, the African continent since 2018. The, the, the next three were, however, family, a family cluster of unknown etiology. None of the individuals had actually traveled outside of um, that area, and so the, the source uh, remains to be unknown. Um, and then on the 16th is when cases were identified at sexual health clinics among gay, bisexual, or other men who have sex with men, or MSM. And four were identified on and reported out on the 16th of May. So the very next day, on May 17th, is when the United States uh, public health authorities were first notified of a suspected case in Massachusetts. And that is a resident in Massachusetts who had traveled to Canada, where um, we had heard that there was also cases occurring. The rash began as anogenital rash, it was vesicles and pustules, which spread to the face and trunk. And testing was done at the Laboratory Response ne um, Network Laboratory in Massachusetts, and that was positive for non-variola orthopox virus through the ortho OPX generic positive test. So since then, cases have um, steadily increased in the United States. As of 2 p.m. Eastern time yesterday, June 22nd, there, uh, there are 155 cases diagnosed in the United States among residents of 24 states and the District of Columbia. And I can say we, we update these every day at 2 p.m., and so I already know that the case count is a little bit higher than this today, but I'm gonna present data about the, the cases we have from yesterday. Um, on this map here that you can see, this is a map that we've been um, I believe pro, uh, posting to our CDC website. You can see the most number of cases are occurring in California, New York State, um, Illinois, Florida, um, Colorado, there are some cases too. So, so th those, those states that I mentioned are the ones that have the most number of cases at this time. So this is an epi curve. Um, it includes all of the case patients for whom we actually have information about the date of rash onset. And we chose rash onset to show in this epi curve because uh, a lot of the case patients involved in, these, in this outbreak um, have not had the typical prodromal symptoms that we associate with monkeypox, or those symptoms seem to have occurred uh, had, but very mild um, and not really recognized. And so it was more reliable for us to use date of rash onset. And you can see the earliest date of rash onset was at the very beginning of May. Um, and the latest is, you know, obviously every day we're hearing about new cases. Um, but I want to just point out that our initial cases that, that were identified in the United States were in people who had traveled abroad. So it was individuals who had gone to large gatherings, um, internationally that where we now understand that there were that there are a lot of cases associated with those um, those specific gatherings in Spain and France and in in Germany so our, our first cases were associated with that and you can see that um, as time has gone on we still are having um, reports of case patients who have traveled abroad themselves but we also are seeing locally acquired infection so there is local transmission occurring so some basic demographics that, that I can share. So our median age here is 37 years, and the range is 20 to 76. So we have a very wide age range here in the United States being affected. Um, most of the case patients are um, male sex at birth. So um, cisgender males, 56. Unknown gender identity, which basically means it wasn't reported to us at CDC, is 82. Refused, 1. Um, all of the patients for whom we know whether or not they have male-to-male -male sexual contact, all of those men, uh, except one, have um, indicated uh, that they have male-to-male -male sexual contact, so 120 out of 121. We do not know for 29, and again, that is uh, because that information has not been reported to CDC. For female sex at birth, we have had five, um, and this includes trans transgender males and also cisgender women, so we have some in both of those categories. Uh, we've had no deaths, um, and in the United States, we have not had any healthcare personnel who have acquired the infection due to providing care for a patient. So now, I just want to tell you some general things that we've learned about uh, the clinical presentation. So every one of our U.S. patients has had a rash or an anthem in all, uh, ha, yeah, in all of them. There's all of them have had, um, only one had only an anthem at the time that the rash, uh, at the time that illness was suspected and that individual was a contact of someone else, and that's why it was identified 
uh, rapidly and the swab test swab from those um, lesions inside the mouth tested positive, but everybody else um, has, has gone on to develop um, a rash on their body. The lesions have been in different phases of development when you see them side by side, so that's something that is, um, I guess, historically not been reported for monkeypox. Lesions see like pustules and vesicles occurring side by side on the same body site. And the rash is either scattered or diffuse. So sometimes it's limited to one body site or mucosal area, like the anogenital region or lips or face. And then other times it's spread out throughout the body. The presenting complaint for some patients has been anal rectal pain or tenesmus. And the physical examination, though, has yielded visible lesions and proctitis. So we have not had any, any cases involving people who have not had visible lesions somewhere. Uh, prodromal symptoms, as I mentioned, have been mild or not occurring, and fever and lymphadenopathy, which we've commonly associated with monkeypox, are not necessarily occurring in all of the patients. Um, we've all, we're also seeing co-infections with sexually transmitted infections, so a diagnosis of um, a sexually transmitted infection like syphilis or herpes does not rule out monkeypox, as we're seeing from some of our case patients. Oh, um, the lesions, though, despite all these things that are perhaps not considered um, typical of the classic monkeypox, are still firm, deep-seated, well-circumscribed, and sometimes umbilicated. So it still has that, that basic tenet of monkeypox um, infections that I showed pre a few slides ago. The thing is, though, that these lesions are sometimes very small in the current outbreak, as you can see from these photographs on the, the two in the left, that panel A and panel B are um, uh, individuals involved in this current outbreak. Um, but panel C is from the 2003 U.S. outbreak, and it is also very similar. So you can see that um, the lesions have occur I mean, this is consistent with monkeypox. It's just that the lesions seem to be much smaller, and there are some atypical aspects to them. But papula vesic vesicular and postural lesions have been are, are being seen side by side. Um, I did not post here in my slide deck, but there are some um, very good photographs now being published in a lot of manuscripts about lesions in the anogenital region. And so I'd uh, recommend that people, if they're, if they're wanting to see what those lesions look like, there's um, a reference here, reference number two that I've listed on this slide. There's also other manuscripts that are being published in Lancet ID and in um, New England Journal, among others, that show uh, the, the photographs in the anogenital region. So these are some other photographs, the next two slides, just to show you what these lesions look like. Again, smaller, um, but there is umbilication in some of the lesions. They are still firm, deep-seated, uh, well-circumscribed round lesions, even if they're scabbed over, which um, in the bottom row here on the far left, that one is scabbed over, but it's still a well-circumscribed, firm, deep-seated lesion. It, does, it can affect the palms and soles, but not, not necessarily always. And then here on this next slide, these are all actually case patients from here in the United States. So um, hopefully you can see the same thing, firm, deep-seated, sometimes umbilicated. Um, it, yeah, the, the, the finger photographs that you can see on the right side of this slide, you can see that they are deep-seated and umbilicated and well-circumscribed. So these are all um, how it's presenting. And as you can see from the photographs on the far left, um, scattered sometimes, not necessarily a large number of lesions in one part of the body. So what uh, we um, have at this time, uh, guidance is changing, but as we're learning more information, but we, we have, are conveying to uh, clinicians through the, the HAN or health alert that was sent out, I think it was last week, was to observe for the classic monkeypox rash um, and to obtain swabs from that, or if they observe a rash that could be consistent with monkeypox in persons with epidemiologic risk factors, and those include contact with a person or people with a similar appearing rash or diagnosed with monkeypox, close or intimate in-person contact with people in a social network experiencing monkeypox activity, like men who have sex with men who meet partners through an online website, digital app, or social event, or history of recent international travel to a country currently reporting cases, that they also obtained swabs from those lesions. Um, the, when lesions are not consistent with classic lesions, a full body skin exam should be done. Um, we are hearing that even though not all of the lesions on an individual might be consistent with that classic presentation, that clinicians are finding that um, firm, deep-seated, well-circumscribed, sometimes umbilicated lesions somewhere on the body, and, um, and that might tip suspicion. And again, just a reminder that the diagnosis of a sexually transmitted infection does not rule out co-infection with monkeypox. 
So in, in case you're wondering what we at CDC are doing right now, so um, the things on this slide are some of the current CDC priorities. We are trying to understand the clusters and the cases occurring in various parts of the country, as well as risk factors for acquiring infection and um, also outcomes. We are in our laboratory is sequencing genomes, trying to understand how these might be related to previous genomes um, based on the um, sequencing that they've done um, in Nigeria as part of the work that has been gone on, that CDC has done for um, years now in, um, in Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo and Nigeria in particular. Launching retrospective and prospective zero surveys to try to understand whether or not there have been cases occurring before the cases were identified in the United States and before the um, travel to Europe may have occurred. Developing a natural history study to understand this better, um, expanding testing capacity to commercial laboratories, and providing case by case consultations for treatment and post exposure prophylaxis. And this is just a subset of the things that we're working on. Um, and then finally, I'll just end to say that the, the guidance on this issue is evolving as we learn more, and we are trying to update the CDC website um, with information. The, the, the topics here listed are just a subset of the things that are covered on the CDC website, but you can find them at www.cdc.gov monkeypox, and they include things like case definitions, clinical recognition, contact tracing, exposure risk assessment, guidance for monitoring exposed persons, infection control and healthcare settings, specimen collection, and considerations for medical countermeasures. Uh, so all of this is evolving, and as we know, as we get more information, the content might also change. Um, the considerations for medical countermeasures piece is what um, my colleague, Dr. Peterson, will be uh, presenting in the next presentation. And I think that is my last slide. I can take any questions, if there are any. Thank you. This presentation is now open for questions. Uh, Dr. Lair. Thank you for this presentation. I found it very helpful. Could you explain what you mean by deep seated? I'm interpreting that as it seems to go down below the skin and is um, deeper, but can you give explain it in other words? Yeah, it is it is that. It's like not the way that varicella zoster looks, you know, varicella zoster looking superficial. Um, by deep seated, um, if you run your hands through it, you're going to be able to tell that it's something that's deeper in. It's not something that's easily going to be unroofed with your fingertip, for example. Um, does that ha help, Dr. Lair? Yes, you confirmed my suspicion. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bell. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Rao. I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the epidemiologic characteristics or the type or the place of exposure, the settings um, that where transmission is assumed to have occurred. I get a sense from some of the points that you've made that um, this is associated with large gatherings or um, certain specific settings. And, and I think it might be helpful um, to get a little better sense of that. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Bell. So yes, we are looking into uh, clusters across the country and it is sounding to us similar to what the international community, scientific communities have established and that um, most of these cases are occurring in, in men who have sex with men and um, individuals who seem to have gotten the cases through, you know, secondary and tertiary spread seem to have had sex um, with, with, um, with other men. So there are some uh, women also involved, and it looks like uh, women have been involved likely also through close contact, through intimate contact um, with men. Um, and But we're trying to evaluate that and try to understand that better. In terms of large gatherings, yeah, the events that uh, events internationally, there were some large pride, pride events um, internationally that occurred in the Canary Islands and in Berlin and some other places, and there, there seem to be some clusters around that. Um, Montreal has reported that a bathhouse um, is associated with uh, many of their cases, and similarly in the U.S., we're investigating that as well. Um, so those are the sort of events. We have also heard about some um, sex parties, um, uh, so gatherings in that way, so not necessarily public, I guess, but um, personal, private, private events as well have been associated with some of the cases that we've heard, out, heard about in this country as well as internationally. 
Um, but any close contact, we, I just, I just want to also just uh, say that it is not just men who have sex with men who are affected. As I mentioned, there are women here. Um, we also have heard uh, worldwide about uh, close contacts, like close household members who, through example, shared bedding, towels, have acquired infection too. So um, it is not just through close intimate contact that this is being spread. And we do have, have heard of cases that have um, been associated with uh, being a close household member or a close colleague at work and, and that sort of thing. Thank you. I'm going to call on Dr. Romero. Um, I think you wanted to offer comment as well. I did. Um, thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, just to follow up on, on, on Dr. Lair's question about deep-seated. So um, I learned this during the vaccination effort that was done for smallpox in the past, in, in the beginning of this, this century, if you will. But um, there's something called a thumb sign and that, that was used for smallpox. And it, it, these vesicles are particularly tough and you can rub your, your thumb over the vesicle if it doesn't rupture like it would with chicken pox. Um, you know, that's, that's the deep-seated nature of the, of, of, the, of the vesicle itself. Although looking at your pictures, Dr. Rao, it would seem that some of these would probably not pass the thumb sign. So I, I just offer that as a historical reference. Yeah, I, I don't know if the pictures might not have been ideal, but, um, and some of them are so small that maybe we can't put our thumb on it, but uh, what we've heard is that they've all been, that none of them have been superficial, like chicken pox is what we've heard. Or if they have been, then there's co-infection possibly that might've been going on. And we do know that, um, from our work in Africa that co-infection with um, varicella does occur with monkeypox. Thank you. Um, Dr. Schaffner. Well, my historical reference first is that smallpox lesions were often described as firm or rubbery, if that's any help. But my question is, is there any sense that there might be transmission before the rash is present? Yeah, you know, as part of the um, natural history study that we're doing, we're trying to look into that, but we are not aware of that um, from our from our years of working on monkeypox at CDC, we're not aware of asymptomatic transmission or transmission before someone develops symptoms. Um, but we are, you know, we're, I guess we, we are open to all of this and we're, we're certainly investigating this um, as if uh, we should, you know, try to, try to confirm that. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Hey, thank you, A very helpful presentation. I'm also finding the website extremely helpful, but can you comment if we do suspect a patient has it in our office, do you recommend we contact the CDC directly or health department? Should we try to uh, uh, obtain samples and send it to uh, a commercial lab or what are the practical approaches if we suspect a patient? Yeah, so if you if you suspect a patient the, at this time, um, the the recommendation is to call your health department because they're coordinating the obtaining of specimens and, um, and sending them to the, the local LRN laboratory. Um, that that very well that, that is likely to change as um, as this testing is rolled out to other laboratories like commercial laboratories. And I believe the plan is once it is rolled out to commercial laboratories that the the test result would be. Um, conveyed to public health, whether it's positive or negative, that it would be conveyed to public health and um, that clinicians might not need to go through health departments. But but I guess I'll, I'll say that there'll be more information about, about that once um, it happens. We'll have more updated information on our website. But for right now, if you see a case patient, if you see a case um, that you suspect in your office, that you should call public health, local public health. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Dr. Rao, I think um, if you have the opportunity, it would be really helpful to have these slides posted on the website. I'm sure a lot of people will be looking for them. Thank you. Okay. I think Jessica's saying that it should have been posted, but if it has not, then we will do that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, next, we will move to uh, Dr. Sorry, my, my glasses were off, Dr. Brett Peterson, who will be discussing medical countermeasures for monkeypox. Great, thank you very much. So as indicated, I will be providing an overview of the medical countermeasures for monkeypox. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Um, we are fortunate that due to smallpox preparedness, there are a number of medical countermeasures that have been stockpiled for smallpox and can be used for other orthopox viruses like monkeypox. With respect to vaccines, we do have two vaccines available, Genios and ACAM2000. And with respect to treatment, uh, Ticoviramat is a first-line agent, and we also have vaccin Vaccinia immune globulin and Sidofavir available in our strategic national stockpile. And I'll go through all of these medical countermeasures. First is Genios, which is a live vaccine produced from the strain modified Vaccinia Ankara Bavarian Nordic. This is an attenuated, non-replicating orthopox virus. It's also known as Invimune or Invinex or MVA. This vaccine was licensed by FDA in September of 2019 for the prevention of smallpox and monkeypox disease in adults 18 years of age and older. CDC is developing an expanded access investigational new drug protocol to allow the use of Genios for monkeypox in pediatric populations. And currently there is one pediatric, one pediatric patient that has received Genios under a single patient investigational new drug protocol. The other vaccine, ACAM2000, is a live vaccinia virus vaccine. This is a replicating virus. Uh, ACAM2000 was licensed by FDA in August of 2007. It replaced the previously licensed vaccine, Drivax. And ACAM2000 is specifically licensed for active immunization against smallpox disease for persons determined to be at high risk for smallpox infection. So consequently, CDC does hold an emergency access investigational new drug protocol to allow the use of ACAM2000 for non varial orthopox virus infections like monkeypox during an outbreak. Now, there are significant differences between these two vaccines. The first and perhaps most uh, important is the uh, vaccine virus themselves with ACAM2000 being a replicating vaccine compared to Genios, which is replication deficient. Uh, consequently, ACAM2000 does produce a take or a vaccine site lesion at the site of inoculation, where Genios does not. Uh, and as such, ACAM2000 does have a risk of inadvertent inoculation and auto inoculation from the infectious virus that's present in these vaccine site lesions. And also, ACAM2000 has a risk for serious adverse events due to uncontrolled replication. Uh, which are not expected to occur with Genios. With respect to cardiac adverse events, uh, ACAM2000 has uh, myopericarditis reported at a rate of 5.7 per 1,000 primary vaccinees. And with Genios, there has not been myopericarditis reported in association with the, this vaccine. So there is a theoretical risk, but if there is any risk present, it is believed to be lower than that for ACAM2000. With respect to effectiveness, ACAM2000 was licensed by FDA based on comparisons of the immunologic response and take rates to Drivax, the previously vaccinated, the previously licensed vaccine, excuse me. And Genio similarly was assessed by comparing the immunologic response uh, to ACAM2000 and also taking into account animal studies. For administration, ACAM2000 is given percutaneously by multiple puncture technique in a single dose, whereas Genios is given subcutaneously in two doses separated by 28 days. So with respect to vaccine supply, um, as of June 14th, the Strategic National Stockpile holds, held more than 36,000 courses of the two-dose regimen for Genios and is available for immediate um, release. Uh, to date, there's been a, a little more than 4,000 courses uh, requested and distributed to a total of uh, 18, I'm sorry, 28 jurisdictions. Um, there's an additional 150,000 courses available at the manufacturer that are expected to be delivered over the next few, few weeks. Uh, in addition, there are 500 courses also available at the manufacturer awaiting release that we do expect to be delivered this year. And lastly, there's a, been an order for 250,000 additional courses to be manufactured from existing bulk vaccine, which also is expected to be delivered later this year. Um, and that comes from a total of uh, 7.9 million courses of uh, bulk drug that could be filled and finished upon request by the U.S. government. For ACAM2000, there are currently more than 100 million doses in the strategic national stockpile. 
So in terms of recommendations uh, for pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, ACIP did vote in November of last year to recommend vaccination for select persons at risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses. And this, these recommendations were published in June of this year uh, in a policy note, which is currently available. In those recommendations, people who are recommended to receive pre-exposure prophylaxis include the clinical laboratory personnel who perform testing to diagnose orthopox viruses, including those who are using the PCR assays for diagnosis of orthopox viruses, including monkeypox. Um, also recommended are research laboratory workers who directly handle cultures and animals contaminated or infected with orthopox viruses. And lastly, certain healthcare and public health response team members designated by public health authorities to be vaccinated for preparedness purposes are also included in this recommendation. Pre-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare workers is possible under um, shared clinical decision-making, but at this time, most clinicians in the United States and laboratories not performing the orthopox virus generic test to diagnose orthopox viruses are not advised to receive orthopox virus pre-exposure prophylaxis. Laboratorians should consult with laboratory safety officers and supervisors to identify risks and precautions depending on the type of work that they are doing, and clinicians and laboratorians should use recommended infection control practices. With respect to contraindications for ACAM 2000 and GINEOS for pre-exposure prophylaxis, there are a number of contraindications for ACAM 2000 in both the primary vaccinees as well as household contacts uh, based on populations known to be at high risk for adverse events. In, in contrast, GINEOS uh, carries a contraindication for individuals who have a serious vaccine component, component allergy. In terms of uh, our response in the current outbreak, we're focusing on tried and true public health measures, including robust surveillance to identify cases and confirm uh, through laboratory diagnosis, followed by containment through isolation of cases and contact tracing, and vaccination of close contacts with post-exposure prophylaxis based on a risk as exposure assessment um, with guidance available on CDC's website. Um, this includes uh, post-exposure prophylaxis being recommended for individuals with a high degree of exposure and for those with an intermediate degree of exposure to be recommended PEP based on an individual basis to determine whether benefits of PEP outweigh the risks. It, should, it is important to note that brief interactions and those conducted using appropriate PPE in accordance with standard precautions um, are not high risk and generally do not do not warrant post-exposure prophylaxis. With respect to other vaccine strategy considerations, we are aware that there are jurisdictions with larger number of cases that are reporting high percentages of contacts that cannot be identified. And there are several considering, planning, and even implementing expanded vaccination programs at this time. Um, many are following uh, similar approaches to strategies being used in uh, Montreal and the United Kingdom. However, there are currently limited um, supply of GINEOS. Uh, so um, CDC, in planning for expanded vaccination in the United States, is carefully considering how best to use these limited supplies. Uh, we have heard from some jurisdictions that there are concerns about potential serious adverse events with the use of ACAM 2000, especially considering milder, milder disease is commonly being reported in this outbreak. And we are working with the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, federal, state, local, and other community partners to move forward as quickly as possible to provide recommendations to expand vaccination. And we are using an evidence to recommendation framework to really structure these deliberations and guide the development of vaccine strategies. So shifting gears just a little bit, moving to treatment. Um, it's important to start with the statement that many individuals infected with monkeypox virus have a mild self-limiting disease course, even in the absence of specific therapy. But the prognosis for monkeypox does depend on multiple factors, including previous vaccination status, initial health status, and concurrent illnesses or comorbidities. With that in mind, CDC has provided some treatment considerations for monkeypox and recommends considering treatment um, following consultation with CDC for persons with severe disease, 
as well as persons who may be at high risk for severe disease, for example, people with immunocompromising conditions, pediatric populations, pregnant or breastfeeding women, people with a history of presence of atopic dermatitis or other exfoliative skin conditions, and people with one or more complications. Uh, lastly, persons with aberrant infections um, in anatomical areas that may present a special hazard, such as the genitals or anus, can also be considered for treatment for monkeypox. Atikavirmat is an antiviral medication that is approved by the FDA for treatment of human smallpox in adults and pediatric patients weighing at least uh, three kilograms. This is also known as TPOX or ST246, and both oral and IV formulations have been approved by FDA. Um, Ticavirmat is indicated for the treatment of human smallpox only, and so CDC does hold an emergency access investigational new drug protocol to allow the use of Ticavirmat for non varial orthopox virus infections, including monkeypox. So currently, Ticavirmat is available from the Strategic National Stockpile as an oral capsule formulation as well as uh, intravenous vial. Vaccinia immune globulin is another product of EIG IV, is licensed by the FDA for the treatment of complications due to vaccinia vaccination, um, including those listed here. CDC similarly holds an emergency access investigational new drug pro protocol to allow the use of VIG IV for non varial orthopox virus infections, including monkeypox. Um, and this product may be used in um, uh, unique cases, uh, severe cases, as uh, adjunctive therapy or otherwise. Lastly, the Strategic National Stockpile holds sidofovir, also known as Vistide, which is an antiviral medication that is approved for FDA for the treatment of cytomegalovirus retinitis in patients with um, AIDS. We have an extend, expand emergency access investigational new drug protocol to allow for use of this product for monkeypox as well. So I'll end by noting that CDC is available for consultations to assist with medical countermeasure utilization, including appropriate vaccine and antiviral use. Clinicians can work with their state or territorial health authorities to request vaccines, Ticaviramat, PIG, or Sidofavir, and health departments can reach out to CDC consultants through the CDC Emergency Operations Center. So with that, I will end and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Peterson. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Cotton. Thanks very much for that very informative and high yield talk. I was wondering about brinsidofavir. Brinsidofavir is a lipid preparation of sidofavir, and it's much, much better tolerated than major side effect is diarrhea, and it's approved um, for smallpox. Has there been consideration for use with monkeypox? Thank you. So yes, Prinzidofavir is actually a prodrug of Sidofavir. It's a lipidated formulation of Sidofavir. Um, and as you note, it is uh, licensed by FDA for treatment of smallpox. Uh, we are working with um, uh, government agencies and the manufacturer of this product as it is not currently available in the stockpile, but in investigating ways to make it available if needed uh, for monkeypox and also working with our regulatory authorities to make sure that we have a regulatory mechanism um, to use it given that it's not licensed for monkeypox, uh, but putting in place an ex um, expanded access investigational new drug protocol similar to our other medical countermeasures uh, to ensure that it could be used if needed. Thank you very much. Do you have um, any kind of ETA on that? I can't speak to an ETA at this point, but it is actively being worked on. Thank you. Dr. Lair. Thank you for this talk. Could you please go to slide 15 and clarify, you've got 13 kilograms in two lines and three kilograms in one line. I'm just wondering which one's the accurate number. The so first bullet point has 13, in the middle there's three, and towards the bottom it has 13 kilograms. Yeah, so apologies for um, some uh, typos here. It, it, the first bullet should be three kilograms. Um, there are different um, weight requirements depending on if it's being used as a oral formulation or the IV formulation, but the IV formulation um, is uh, approved for use in adult and pediatric patients weighing at least three kilograms. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, Dr. Chen. It, yes, uh, thank you, Drs. Peterson and Rao for the uh, situational update and the medical countermeasures uh, discussion. Do, do you have similar uh, numbers for the stockpile limits for the Tecovir Imat and the um, uh, Vaccinia immunoglobulin or other products? You, you did discuss that for the, um, for the vaccines, but uh, I was just wondering if the, these therapeutics also had similar limitations. Yeah, so specifically with regard to Ticavermat and VIGIV and Sidofavir, um, the precise numbers of uh, those stockpiles have, have not been released, but um, we do have sufficient quantity. We don't expect any supply limitations um, in any of those medical countermeasures. And, and I guess I, I know that the uh, it looks like the New York City Department of Health has already uh, been coordinating with the CDC. Looks like they're trying to stage a uh, a vaccination clinic in Manhattan. Uh, are there similar uh, kind of movements by other health authorities uh, in other regions that are, are also uh, trying to access vaccines and or therapeutics? And are there some, some things that perhaps need to be uh, you know, more widely disseminated uh, rapidly uh, regarding those types of uh, activities? Yeah, so we are coordinating with New York City and other jurisdictions that are uh, working to expand um, uh, their vaccination programs, as discussed previously. Um, fortunately, we are working with the Strategic National Stockpile. They are able to um, ship these medical countermeasures very rapidly. So in general, within 28 hours, we can get a product where it needs to go. Um, however, as previously discussed with Genios, there are some supply limitations that we're working to uh, address um, and make sure that um, this medical countermeasure in particular is being um, provided uh, and used in an optimal fashion, uh, but also an equitable fashion. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. No, thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, no, that was, um, and Dr. Rather, very information, a lot of important information. I was just wondering from a practical standpoint, um, how do we get access to the vaccine and also to the medications? Is it, does this all go through the local health department who contacts CDC? And so I'm, I'm just wondering about the chain of events that have to happen before one um, has this available. Yes, yeah, so currently we are requesting that those medical countermeasure requests come from our health department so that uh, appropriate public health authorities are aware of what's happening and what's available in their jurisdictions. So for uh, clinicians on the ground, um, as with uh, any suspect cases, we are advising them to go directly to their um, local and state public health authorities. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Maldonado. Yeah, thank you for those uh, really helpful um, uh, uh, discussions. I have two quick questions. The first one is, uh, my understanding is that the WHO is considering uh, designating this as a public health emergency of international concern, and I uh, imagine that uh, CDC is in those conversations as well. And I wonder, since we're at the end of our ACIP meeting today, and we may not get updates in the near future, um, uh, is there anything that would be different about recommendations from CDC that uh, this uh, international um, designation might lead to? So that's number one. And then the second question is, it, it seems like um, this is not the traditional uh, presentation for orth orthopox uh, virus uh, or monkeypox virus infections that we've seen on the African subcontinent. And in particular for children, um, you, you have not described uh, a big any cases, that, at least about my understanding, kids. And I wonder if you're hearing whether there um, there have been cases reported in children that are the um, usual typical uh, manifestation, or this a typical manifestation? Whether there should be concerns about um, uh, other precautions that children would need to take regarding 
uh, a treatment um, or prophylactic um, interventions. Thank you. Sure. So this is Brad. I'll handle the first question and hand it to Dr. Rao to handle the second question. So you are correct. WHO did convene a meeting this morning, and on their agenda was discussions of uh, whether or not to declare this current monkeypox outbreak a public health of um, emergency of international concern. Uh, CDC has was participating in that meeting. Um, I have not heard the readout from that meeting to see um, whether or not that will occur. Ultimately, that is. Uh, a decision for the WHO Director General. Um, if a FIAC is declared and uh, the United States follows suit and declares a public health emergency as well, uh, that could change some of the regulatory mechanisms um, in terms of these medical countermeasures, uh, making opening up the possibility that they may be used under an emergency use authorization or under emergency use instructions. Uh, but we're still waiting to see um, what may happen with those uh, discussions and if any of those emergency declarations will be made. Yeah, and then uh, this is Algoma. I can answer your second question. So you're correct. We have not had any cases in children in the United States and actually even um, worldwide. I guess we've been on calls with other countries. I, I really, other than um, I think something related to close contacts, there really haven't been Dr. Rao, you keep coming in and out. Oh. Sorry, I there moved no to cases. a different mic now. Yeah, so, um, so I moved to a different mic. So uh, this is Agum. I was just going to say that we, you're correct that there have been no cases in children in the United States and even internationally. We've heard very little um, about cases in children. What we can say about the, uh, you, you mentioned Dr. Maldonado about atypical clinical presentation. So um, the cases that have occurred in Nigeria in general have been a little bit strange for other reasons too. Um, you know, there's been typically this particular clade of monkeypox has not, resu has not um, resulted in more severe illness, has not uh, spread to person to person as much. But we saw even before these 2022 cases that um, the West Africa clade um, um, associated with Nigeria infections has has been a little bit unusual in that there have been some deaths reported and there have been there has been person to person spread including in um, in settings like prisons and in household members and um, one of the imported cases resulted in secondary cases um, including in one healthcare um, healthcare worker. So I guess we don't really know for sure what, you know, why this is presenting unusually, whether it's something related to um, you know, what we've seen for the last few years in West Africa or if it's something different, but we're, gonna, we're, we're trying to understand that. Um, and then as far as if there are cases in children, if they, if they might be different, um, I guess we're just we're relying on what we know from our work before 2022 in Africa and the clinical presentation itself has been similar, but um, the illness has been sometimes more severe in, um, in children. Do you want to add anything, Brett, to that? No, I think that's accurate. Agree. That covers everything oh. I would want to mention. Sorry, Dr. Peterson, go ahead. I was just agreeing that everything that Dr. Rao said is accurate. I don't think I have anything else to add to that. Thank you. Dr. Dries? Thank you to both speakers for really great talks. I just wanted to clarify one thing, which was that the, the PPE that's recommended for care of suspected monkeypox cases includes you know, gloves, eye protection, and a respirator. Um, but you know, typically, if it, it, a healthcare provider may not realize uh, that they're worried about mon monkeypox until they're actually examining the patient and seeing typical lesions, and so they would not necessarily have a respirator on in that, you know, especially in outpatient locations. But what you said was that would not be considered an exposure, at least from, um, at least in terms of use of post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, so there's a, a little bit of a disconnect there, but I, so I just wanted to make sure that that's correct. Um, and thankfully, we are still masking routinely in healthcare. But um, is there any other sort of advice you would give for those healthcare workers who, you know, saw the patient initially without use of the full PPE? Um, I assume just kind of self-monitoring or anything else. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Brett and I were both involved in developing the initial guidance that was placed there. But with the growth of this outbreak, there's been some other folks um, from our CDC Division of Healthcare Quality and Promotion and other 
group so has sort of um, taken that on to lead it. So I guess in the interest of not misspeaking, um, perhaps we could get back to you on that. Just uh, We do know that there's folks working on it. I think the, the two of us have just been um, immersed in other things and aren't up to date. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'll Dr. just Frank add Parker. to that. This is Brett Peterson. Um, that uh, risk exposure assessment is currently being revised and, and will provide specific recommendations for healthcare workers um, as well as uh, community members at large. Uh, so some of that information um, will be revised in the very near future. Okay, um, Dr. Freihofer? Um, Sandra Fryho for American Medical Association. I had read that the Brensadolavir has an improved safety profile over the Sadopavir. Can you comment about that and also about side effects to expect with these antivirals? Sure. So, so that is correct. Um, Sadopavir does carry a risk of renal toxicity and is actually administered in conjunction with cimetidine uh, for renal protection. Um, and it is administered intravenously. Uh, in contrast, brincidofavir is orally available um, and in clinical trials has not shown the same renal toxicity and has uh, so shown some potential for uh, hepatic toxicity as well as some uh, GI side effects. But in, in general, um, the safety profile of brincidofavir uh, does show uh, less severe side effects compared to sidofavir. Uh, what about the picoviramab? In terms of safety, ticoviramat has shown to be um, quite safe and well tolerated um, without any specific uh, safety concerns uh, for severe uh, adverse events that have been raised with ticoviramat. Thank you. Dr. Long? Yes, the epidemiology um, and cases that you, you've described gives us a little bit different image of potential uh, spread to the population in general in, in non-sexual contact. So uh, what, what do you have any reason to believe that this virus is more transmissible? Is more is transmissible in without very close personal contact. Um, so we we haven't heard really what your expectations are of cases uh, outside of uh, sexual transmission. Yeah, the only um, the only all the cases that we're aware of, it's been direct skin to skin contact or contact with. Uh, fomites like towels, bedding, close household member. So um, uh, historically, I guess the the guidance, the, the recommendations um, have been that um, monkeypox can be spread through direct uh, direct contact as well as through um, close uh, proximity because of secretions. The potential of uh, if you're in close proximity for a prolonged period of time to somebody else through secretions, you could. Be exposed, and that's that's what we are currently saying right now. We don't have any reason to suspect spread any other way. Um, and like I said, I, I I can't even think of a case that we know about that hasn't been spread through what sounds like um, either fomites or direct skin to skin contact. Um, sorry, Dr. Long, was there another part to that? Um, uh, do we have any reason to, uh, to believe that it's spread in any other way? I mean, even the sexual, whether it's through actual um, seminal fluids or whether semen or whether it's through um, uh, just close contact that happens through, uh, when, when people have intimate contact is also not entirely clear. Um, but we are trying to understand this. We are planning for, for studies, uh, semen studies and those sorts of studies to understand this better. We just don't have an answer for you right now. I was uh, what I was really um, wondering about uh, is the likelihood that the general U.S. population would be susceptible, should be worried, might get this at the grocery store, at daycare, at school, at usual our usual casual contact with each other. 
Yeah, also, and it doesn't sound yeah. like you're concerned about that at this moment. At this moment, um, all signs are that um, it's that the that it's still not spread to a large number of people. Um, we we believe that uh, a lot of these case patients have had a large number of contacts, and um, you know we're, t we're trying to get to the bottom of like exactly how many contacts and how many people might it might have been spread to. But it appears to be a small number of um, exposed contacts who have who um, have gotten it, and it seems to be pretty intimate contact. Um, so there's no reason at this time to suspect that this is a risk to the wide communities that you just described. Um, the risk to the general public, we believe at this time is still very low. Thanks very much. Ms. Howell? Yes, hi, Molly Howell, representing the Association of Immunization Managers. Um, I just wanted to bring up, you know, the awardees in the 64 immunization programs have been uh, rolling out COVID-19 vaccines, and, and that's been taking, uh, obviously, quite a bit of our time. And so I just wanted to mention if, if a larger campaign may be needed in the future for Zinios or other vaccination, um, we would just appreciate any planning assumptions or guidance as early as possible. And then also uh, a lot of our COVID vaccine funding is very specific to COVID vaccine and cannot be used for any rollout of a monkeypox vaccine initiative. And so I just wanted to mention those couple things. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fry uh, Dr. Freihofer, did you have anything else? Yes, I had one final question. This is uh, again about transmission. On your website, it says also from respiratory secretions during prolonged face-to-face -face contact, but can you just explain that a little bit more? I know that you started that, but just explain that. Yeah, I can I can take a stab at that. I, this is also like this this section, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, another group of experts at CDC have kind of taken um, over because it's their area of expertise more than than ours. But what I can say is it's it's close to close contact, sort of like you know being within six feet for a prolonged period of time, um, and the opportunity for someone's saliva to be exposed to it. It's it's droplets basically. It's respiratory secretions. But you know if someone's Kissing and hugging and um, you know just saliva is is what we're trying to get at with that. Does that help at all? I mean, I, I, similar to the previous question, happy yeah, to get back to you. Thank you. you. That's, yep. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Okay, hey, Dr. Sanchez. Hope you have question. <laughs> yeah, I just I was just wondering. So of the 155 cases that have occurred, there's been no deaths, and um, it seems like many are relatively milder cases or mild cases, but how many, do you know how many have been actually treated to prevent progression or how many have been severe enough that have uh, required therapy, either with um, this Tecovir bat or Sidofavir? Yeah, no, uh, Dr. Sanchez, you bring up a good point. Yes, uh, uh, the cases that have occurred in the United States um, have been mostly managed as outpatient um, outpatient care. Um, there have been some hospitalizations, but those have been due to things like pain control when there's um, proctitis, for example, um, things of that nature. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Peterson. I think Dr. Peterson has some information to answer the, the rest of your question. Sure. So to share some additional uh, information on uh, medical countermeasures that have been released for treatment, um, a total of 197 courses of oral ticavirumab have been distributed to uh, a number of jurisdictions, and at this point, a total of 18 patients in eight jurisdictions have received oral ticavirumab. Um, similar to Dr. Rao's point, we've not seen severe cases, so although there have been some IV ticavirumab that's been distributed, no patients have yet received IV ticavirumab. Um, and so we are working with our state, heart, state partners um, who have received these medical countermeasures so we can monitor outcomes of treatment um, as well as uh, vaccine use to really help inform our vaccine strategy and future clinical consultations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we really appreciate these um, timely updates. And I, I, you know, as you can tell, we're, there's going to be a lot of interest in this particular topic going forward. Um, but we are at the end of our day. <laughs> I'd like to thank every 
one again today. I want to express my thanks to all the speakers um, and our ACIP ex officio and liaison members for all of the work over the past week. Um, I'm feeling pretty exhausted, and I'm feeling most of you must be feeling the same way too. Uh, we've had four days of meetings in the last seven days, including a Saturday in a, in a week that was inclusive of Father's Day and Juneteenth, um, so that the committee could provide timely and transparent information to the public about vaccines and the decision making process. And I know Dr. Wharton and I are extremely grateful for your extra time and for your willingness to go above and beyond in your service to the public. Um, and I want to turn it over to Dr. Wharton to see if she has any last words uh, before we uh, move to adjourn the meeting. Uh, no, I would just like to echo um, Dr. Lee's appreciation to the committee, uh, the ex officios, the liaisons, and all our presenters, um, as well as the public who's been listening in. So, so thank you all. And uh, we appreciate the good discussion, and uh, uh, hopefully it will be a little while before we meet again. We are going to hold you to that, Dr. Wharton. <laughs> uh, are there any objections to adjourning today's meeting? Uh, I just would like to say, and we want to thank you, Dr. Lee, for somehow keeping your composure and your graciousness for all these long hours, and uh, as well as keeping us on schedule. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Long. I appreciate that. I appreciate all my committee members. All right. I don't hear any objections to adjourning today's meeting. So uh, today's meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for your time.